Okay, great. I believe we are live. Good morning, everyone. I am Leah Goldman. I'm Senator Hinge's Chief of Staff, and I'm going to be serving as the MC today on our budget forum. Um, so I'm just going to go through quickly how it's going to run today. Um, so I am going to call on the next speaker before they speak, and then at that point, we will promote you from attendee to panelist. Please make sure that your name matches the name that we have on the spreadsheet uh, for the speaker. If your name does not match, please use the raise hand function when it's your turn to speak so we know who to promote to panelists. We know that that's you. Liv uh, Alvia Luter will be writing in the chat the next three speakers on deck so everyone's aware of who is gonna be coming next. And again, if your name doesn't match the name on the speaker list, please raise your hand. Once we promote you to panelists, you're gonna have three minutes to give your testimony. Shaho, who you can see here, um, is gonna be keeping time and he will hold up a yellow piece of construction paper. Shaho, you wanna hold it up just so people will see. When you have 30 seconds left and a red piece of construction paper when your time is up. And when your time is up, please wrap up. Thank you. Um, and once you're done speaking, um, if the members don't have any questions, we will just demote you back to attendee and you're welcome to stay on for the remainder of the forum. So with that, I'm going to send it over to Senator Hinchy to get us started um, and welcome everyone. Great. Well, thank you, Leah. Uh, and to first and foremost, my whole team and everyone on Assemblymember Fahey's team uh, for helping us put this uh, budget forum together today. Uh, for those who uh, don't know, we are currently in our budget process, uh, the way that we fund state government. Uh, and the way that this process works is the executive, our governor, puts forward uh, their executive budget proposal. Uh, she did that, Governor Hochul and her team put forward that executive budget proposal a few weeks ago. And now the legislature is uh, going through it. We are going through that proposal and we now are responsible for both the Senate and the assembly putting forward our one house budget proposal. So each house of the legislature has a reaction budget to the governor's executive proposal. Uh, we then, after all of us uh, have put together three proposals, we go into three-way negotiations. Uh, and what that is, is uh, people sit down and we negotiate each part of the budget to come up with the full final state budget. We right now are in that one house uh, section where we are looking through the executive budget and also putting forward what we feel should be funded in the budget. Uh, for us and for me, uh, we feel that a budget is a values document. Uh, it's a document that should really uh, prioritize, emphasize, and show uh, showcase very clearly uh, what we want New York State to be, uh, how we want to lead the country, the things that we want to step forward with and show that we can do. Uh, and for us, uh, that's making sure that we are helping our constituents uh, across New York State. And so it's really important that we have not just the organizations and the institutions that are used to uh, lobbying or contacting those in Albany for their priorities, but to also make sure that we can hear directly from people uh, and directly from all of you uh, to let us know what you think is important, uh, what your reaction to the budget is, and, and the things that you think we should be funding, the things that we're doing well, and the things that we should be doing better. Uh, so that's what this forum is. This is a listening session so that we can hear from uh, all of you on what it is that you think should be prioritized in our one house budgets as we go into three way negotiations. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, to be here. Thank you all so much uh, for joining and for spending your time uh, advocating on behalf of your constituencies. I'm excited to learn from you all today. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, invite also our guest here who is joining uh, our budget forum to hear on the assembly side. We have Alyssa Kane, who's assembly member Fahey's chief of staff. Uh, Alyssa, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Senator. Um, we're delighted. Team Fahey is delighted to be uh, invited to be part of this forum. Uh, the budget is a huge, huge project for us right now. Uh, we're swimming in budget. Um, I send deep, deep uh, regrets from Assembly uh, Member Fahey. As many of you know, she's managing uh, a mother's, uh, perhaps a mother's worst nightmare. Her son 
is um, very ill with cancer and she is with him now. Um, and I can tell you that uh, in this period of time that she's been managing this, she has not canceled uh, a meeting. So this would be completely unusual for her. And she is uh, quite sad that she can't be with you because she, as you know, she's an incredible advocate for our region and uh, for the issues that so many of you represent. So um, thank you for being here, the speakers particularly, um, as many of you have experienced already, our office remains poised and, uh, and welcoming of your uh, requests for meetings and for your information about how the budget uh, impacts the work that you do. And um, that is of utmost importance to us during this period of time. Uh, we have collected many of your concerns and have passed that along to leadership. And now it, we're in the process of um, doing the, the, advoc the internal advocacy to make sure that those projects are funded at the level that uh, enable you to do your work um, so thank you speakers for taking the time to be here with us. Um, and uh, you know, the, your, your organizations are vital to our region. Um, so many of you carry you know, this huge load of actually providing the services to our constituents. Many of your not-for-profit organizations and your municipal and state uh, agencies. So we deeply appreciate that. You know, the budget, the governor's budget is a great place to start. This year is unlike any other year. And so uh, we are drinking from a fire hose uh, with cash right now. The problem is that there are so many priorities and there are so many things that we could really leverage uh, that kind of infusion to really make that sea change that we've been looking for in so many areas. So the question is, how, how, do, we, how do we work with that? Um, so, uh, you know, the, we're, we're always concerned about funding for schools, you know, that's been looking good. Uh, support for our small businesses remains on top. Uh, pandemic uh, recovery, climate action, all of those pieces. Um, and specifically here in the capital region, where uh, Pat is laser focused on the Wadsworth uh, lab and its ability to bring um, the, the kind of jobs and attention that we deserve. Um, and the College of Applied Sciences and Engineering uh, at the University of Albany, which uh, really elevates um, that kind of uh, innovation. So thank you so much for signing up. We'll let you get started. And we are listening. Our staff is poised. We're listening. We're taking notes and uh, happy to follow up after this as well. Thank you, Senator, so much for inviting us. Absolutely. Thank you, Alyssa. And I know I can speak for everyone when we send uh, our deep thoughts and uh, love and hope over to the assembly member. And uh, of course, we, we would love for her to be a part of this with us today, uh, but she needs to be somewhere else. And, and we, we are happy that you can be here and join us uh, for the first part of this session. Uh, so we're excited to dive in. Uh, we have a lot of really great speakers, and I know we had others who we were not able to uh, accommodate in our uh, two hour time frame. Uh, but you know, please submit written testimony if you have it, if you have not been able to uh, either have a spot in this forum uh, as Alyssa said, we are here to listen to. Uh, our office is always open for calls. This is not the only time we are hearing about the budget, uh, but we did want to have kind of this public forum to make sure uh, that everybody also in our community knew what was going on in Albany right now. Uh, there's a lot going on always. Uh, it's important to kind of recognize that it's budget time and, and to kind of see the work that, that we do in all of the great organizations uh, that the state funds. Uh, and again, the ways that we need to be uh, thinking bigger and more broadly uh, in how we move forward in this kind of really exciting moment that we have of change uh, in New York State. And so with that, uh, Leah, I will throw it over to you to bring up our first speaker. Great, and our first speaker is David Van Leuven, who is the Town of Bethlehem Supervisor. And you're gonna be promoted to panelists. And as soon as you are panelist, you can uh, begin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, I'm David Van Leeuwen, I'm the Bethlehem Town Supervisor, and I want to start by just thanking you for sharing the opportunity to speak today. But beyond that, I want to thank uh, both you, Senator Hinchy, and Team Fahey uh, for always being here for your communities. Uh, Senator Hinchy, I'm sorry I haven't had the chance to 
uh, meet you in person, but I've heard nothing but good things about you and the work of your team. Uh, team Fahey, led by uh, the assembly member, has been uh, some of Bethlehem's greatest champions and our community is better because of, of, of your leadership. So my request this morning is a simple one, but it's a big one. And that is, um, I'm asking that you please fight to direct a significant portion of the federal infrastructure dollars and any of the other fire hose dollars that are available directly to, to municipalities to restore our aging water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, many have spoken for decades about the desperate need for investment in restoring and rebuilding critical water and sewer infrastructure across New York State. <laughs> but I've heard very few acknowledge the actual responsibility for this infrastructure is entirely at the municipal level. Now in the town of Bethlehem, for example, we have 400 miles of water and sewer lines. The town maintains all of them. We also have two water plants and one wastewater treatment plant. Again, the town maintains all of them. The state does an invaluable, an invaluable job setting standards for drinking water and sewage treatment but it is municipalities that actually do the work. Bethlehem delivers 1.6 billion gallons of clean, safe drinking water to almost 12,000 homes and businesses every year. And we ensure that the 1.6 billion gallons of effluent from our sewage treatment plant is cleaner than the Hudson River that it flows into. And I expect that you will see similar patterns in cities and towns throughout the Hudson region and statewide. The intention of the federal infrastructure dollars is to restore and improve our nation's aging infrastructure. I assert that we have this opportunity with the influx of other dollars to really start taking a real bite at this overwhelming challenge. Please do everything you can to get these dollars to municipalities where it will actually be used to improve critical water and sewer infrastructure and thereby will best serve our residents and businesses, create jobs and protect the environment. Again, I want to thank uh, both you, Senator Hinchy, and Team Fahey for your leadership. And please don't hesitate to contact me if there's anything I can do to help you in your important work. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor. And we we agree water infrastructure. We have absolutely have a responsibility at the state level for to help our municipalities with water infrastructure. So thank you for raising that important point. Thank you. And next up, we have Christine Duffy. She's, she's just moving over. It takes a minute sometimes. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't. There you are. Hello. That's okay. I'm not very photogenic. We got you now. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Hinchy and team assembly member Fahey. I, I do appreciate that you let me participate today. I'm asking if you will consider um, dedicating some money in the education budget to fund a pilot program for education ombudsman. Education ombudsmen operate all over the United States. NICE said is the only quasi administrative agency in New York State without an education ombudsman and without an ombudsman period. What an ombudsman does that is different than everything else that's already in place is that they are neutral advocates and problem solvers on the front lines. When the lines of communication have broken down between a parent, a child, and a principal or a teacher or a school district, that's where the education ombudsman gets involved immediately. It helps the taxpayers avoid lawsuits. It helps the teachers so that they can get back to their jobs of teaching. It help, they help principals 
so that they're not distracted from um, trying to help a parent gain the tools to help solve their own problem. And that's where there's a, a gap in the education process. I'm asking that the, um, that the budget consider a pilot. There is a way to wrap a pilot around into another New York State agency. For example, Children and Family Services, they handle six different units of New York State. And it, it could be a reasonable pilot if we were to use Children and Family Services Call Center and, and pilot an ombudsman program. That's all I'm asking. I'd like to send the nuts and bolts of it um, to your offices to review if that's okay. Absolutely, please please do. And we know you have our contact info and our email. So please uh, send Thank that over. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Christine. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Megan Bates from the Gilderland Central School District. Good morning. Um, I'm Megan Bates. I'm speaking on behalf of Gilderland Central School District. I also sit on the board for New York School Nutrition Association. Um, and I just want to start by thanking both uh, Senator Hinchy and Assemblywoman Fahey for their continued support of School of Meals um, and everything we do. We really appreciate all your support and your help through all of this. Um, we have two kind of asks for the budget this year. Um, our first big ask is the continuation and support of universal free meals for our students in school districts. Um, since March of 2020, all students have had equal access to free school meals, um, regardless of their family income. And we're asking for your continued support of that, um, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level. Um, we have just seen the, the release of that stigma associated with school meals for only free and reduced children. Our participation levels have gone absolutely um, through the roof. We're looking at probably 50 to 60% increase in participation for these kids who really are, um, a lot of them are at an at-risk level. Um, and because that stigma is gone, they really have been able to um, participate and take a hold of this program. Um, and the second thing we're asking for is your support of the transfer of the child nutrition program to ag and markets. Um, it's, we are trying to do so much with ag and markets. Um, we all really support the Farm to School program. And we just think that because so much of our oversight comes from USDA, that if we could just be streamlined with them under ag and markets, which is under the USDA, it would just make a lot more sense. Um, we are all really supportive of the New York Farm to School program um, that Child Nutrition is um, co-sponsoring right now and able to give schools back an additional 30 cents for um, meals that are sourced from New York State. So we're asking that if we moved under ag and markets, it would make our relationships with farmers and our ability to source food locally uh, a lot easier and since all, most of our funding is at the federal level and comes through USDA, we will be able to take those dollars that are coming through in our reimbursement and reinvest them locally and boost our local economies and give back to local farms around us and really just grow that farm to school in relationship um, with local farmers and local programs. So again, I just wanna thank you for all your support um, and we are hopeful that we can have a great partnership working forward uh, and moving forward. Thank you very much, two very important points. Great, and next up we have Gary Kleppel. Thank you so much, Megan. Whoops. There you are, Gary. My name is Gary Klippel, and I'm uh, chair of the Agricultural Advisory Committee for the town of Knox. Uh, I want to thank you, Senator Hinchy and Senator Fahey, uh, uh, Assemblyperson Fahey, for inviting me to speak today. I would ask for your help 
in addressing uh, the serious limitations in meat processing capacity in New York State that restrict our access to safe meat, threaten the financial security of thousands of New York farmers and the viability of their farms, and undermine the vitality of our agricultural economy. Uh, New York has more than 300 meat processing plants, but only 32 are USDA certified. Only USDA inspected meat can be sold in retail and wholesale markets, and meat from non-USDA, so-called custom exempt plants, cannot be marketed. Each year, more than 100,000 head of cattle plus swine, lambs, goats, and poultry need to be processed through USDA plants. So while there's, there are many processing plants in New York State, there's a critical shortage of USDA inspected plants. Furthermore, infrastructure at USDA plants is insufficient to meet demand, no less to grow the industry. And finally, there are ser serious labor shortages in the meatpacking industry. Funding by New York State can help resolve these challenges. We can increase the number of USDA inspected plants by getting custom exempt plants certified. New York uh, State can help secure that funding, the funding needed to certify these plants. Custom exempt processors say they would be interested in pursuing USDA certification if funding was available. Well, fe federal funding is available, but process are not, processors are not grant writers and the bureaucratic hurdles are difficult to navigate. Uh, a line in the New York, State's, in New York State's budget funding cooperative extension and other groups to collaborate on proposal writing and overcome bureaucratic challenges would ex expedite USDA certification. New York State funds should be directed toward increasing the capacities of existing USDA inspected plants. Investment by New York State to overcome limitations in cooler, freezer, and cutting room capacity at USDA plants can as much as triple New York's meat production capabilities. New York State needs to increase um, uh, uh, meat processing, the meat processing labor force. Uh, New York can overcome workforce challenges by focusing more of SUNY's budget on, uh, on meat processing, uh, processor training, and on developing uh, apprenticeships at USDA facilities. Meat is an important source of protein for most New Yorkers. Life, the livestock uh, sector is critically important to New York State's agricultural economy. For animal agriculture to remain viable, the gaps in our meat processing industry must be filled, and the New York State budget is the place where that begins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Great. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next up, we have Jill Lowe. Oh, I'm glad I made it through those hurdles. I was nervous that I was going to screw this up. Um, You're great, Jill. I, Good to see you. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, Senator Hinchy, and thank uh, Assemblymember Fahey for your ongoing advocacy on environmental issues. Uh, Senator Hinchy, we had a meeting with Brian from your office last week to discuss New York Renew's $15 billion ask to fund the C CLCPA to make sure it's implemented to um, address the climate crisis, um, fund the transition to renewables, fund support for low and middle income residents to make the transition to renewables and retrofit their homes and to address environmental racism. Uh, there's a meeting at noon with Assemblymember Fahey's office on this issue, but based on other recent meetings, I think that that is also going to go very well. So I thank you for your advocacy on that. However, I get no sense from either chamber leader that addressing the climate crisis is a priority. So I would like to ask both of you to do what you can to impress upon them that this is one of the most important issues to your constituents and that we can't keep kicking the climate can down the road. We've had members with other legislators who also have mentioned, have told us that this isn't their priority and we have to get them on board. Um, really the virtual silence from both of the leaders is um, kind of deafening. And without um, 
their support and the support of the committee leaders, I'll admit, uh, the CLCPA is just going to remain unfunded. Um, on a semi-related issue, I don't know where either of you stand on um, repealing the rebate of the stock transfer tax, but that would provide like 10 to $13 billion per year, some of which could be dedicated to um, funding the transition to renewables and addressing environmental racism. So those are my asks to do what you can to get both chamber leaders on board with um, funding the CLCPA and looking into or supporting the repeal of the stock transfer tax for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for your advocacy. It's great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Jill. Um, and next up we have Edna Litton. Thank you, Jill. Hey, Edna. Hi. Um, I thank, thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I am here to respectfully ask Senator Hinchy and Assembly Member Fahey to advocate for including funds in the state budget to help Meals on Wheels and similar meal delivery programs switch to reusable trays. Since meals are delivered on a regular basis, delivery drivers can easily pick up the used trays. I'm a member of Beyond Plastics, a national nonprofit group that works to replace single-use plastic products with reusable and zero waste alternatives. One clearly effective way to reduce plastic waste is by helping Meals on Wheels switch to reusable trays for their meals. Single-use plastics overwhelmingly end up in landfills or in incinerators, which release toxic carbon dioxide and toxic gases, or scattered through the environment where they pollute our air, soil, and water. Because there is no widespread effective recycling of plastic, we need to reduce the amount of plastic that is used once and thrown away. We would usually prefer non-plastic re reusable materials like glass and metal, but they are not practical for Meals on Wheels. Still, polypropylene trays are environmentally preferable to disposals to disposables after just 10 uses. Reusable trays pay for themselves after about 25 uses and last for over a thousand uses. One $10 tray used a thousand times saves $290 over 1,000 single use plastic trays at 30 cents each. Reusable trays are better for the environment and less expensive to use, even with the energy use and cost of dishwashing factored in. Some Meals on Wheels programs have been using reusable trays for years and can attest to their satisfaction with them. More detailed information on reusable trays and the logistics of the transition can be obtained from at, by contacting Alexis Goldsmith at Beyond Plastics. A big roadblock for Meals on Wheels programs seeking to switch to reusable trays is the initial cost of the trays and possibly a dishwasher. That is why I'm asking you to see that money for those initial expenses is included in the state budget so we can reduce plastic pollution while saving thousands of dollars a year for meal delivery programs throughout the state. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Edna. And just a, a comment, uh, you know, we agree we have a, a major plastics issue and uh, Assemblymember Fahey and I have been working on a lot of uh, single-use plastic issues and reusable, especially in the cannabis space. Uh, but that's something that we're, we're really focused on and uh, something that I'm excited about too is industrialized hemp and really starting that market here in New York, which I think uh, will be a big help to uh, removing plastics from our world, which we need to do at a much faster speed than we are currently doing. So Indeed. thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Edna. Uh, and next up we have Ray Dykeman. You're still muted, right? Now. Yep. Sorry, can you hear me? Hey, Ray. Hey, Senator Hinchy, how you doing? So, uh, as I, as always, I appreciate uh, everything Senator Hinchy has done 
at least communicate with me. I uh, haven't met uh, Team Fahey, but if you're anything like uh, Senator Hinchy's team, uh, um, I appreciate the uh, all uh, the responses back I get from uh, Team Hinchy. Um, again, I'm reaching out to you today. Um, uh, I am a dairy farmer in uh, Fultonville, New York, and uh, I'm asking, I uh, appreciated the other day when you met with the uh, team, uh, the NEDPA team, and uh, talked about the uh, some of the things that agriculture is going through and some of the requests for budget items there. And I'm sure you got their request for funding there. So I, I don't want to get into that, but I, if you need that, I can get that for you. But I guess I want to personally testify today in support of agriculture um, because my commitment to the, the industry of ag and my passion for agriculture um, will never die, even if I end up not even being able to be in the business someday. But I will. Over the over 40 years of being in the ag business with my brother, um, I never, uh, my, my positive attitude never wavered. Went through the long hours, low pay, the weather, um, dealing with employees that I love, um, you know, being up all night and things like that. And even sometimes not even being able to take a paycheck in my industry because of building a business in an industry that I love. And I never realized that it would take a wage board, if you can call it that, that would determine my fate and, and, the, and, a, and a few people or a couple people that would have, that would trigger me into such a state that I realized that building my ag business in this state is no longer viable. It seems as they have ignored the overwhelming support to keep the overtime level of 60, um, making decisions with little to no research at all and listening more to special interest groups um, that promote their own agenda than they are seeking out the real facts of what's going on in the industry. This farm labor situation is not like a big company where CEOs are taking huge pay packages and stuff like that. The owners of these farms are not taking big pay. And I found it interesting that the uh, the president of the AFL-CIO mentioned that he called this a sob story by farmers when he's bringing home a few hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'll guarantee you that there's not one of these farms that's up, that's working 60 to 80 hours a week that's bringing in that kind of money. And they have a tremendous responsibility um, what's going on. So when you talk about budgeting for the state, we can't keep damaging these businesses that are bringing in huge dollars to the state and, and they expect that we're gonna be able to put money in the budget to fund these other projects when we're damaging our agricultural business. Um, so I always look at who's gonna suffer when the agriculture businesses are no longer here. And it's basically my vendors are gonna suffer tremendously. Uh, millions of dollars over the years that I've put in to my local vendors. And I can send you a list of them if you'd like. Thank you. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things that are happening right now that the my employees, uh, 35 employees that I employ are gonna go seeking employment in other states because I'm not gonna be able to afford to do what they're gonna do over the next 10 years with lowering the overtime threshold. Um, if they choose to do that, um, I'm afraid the farmer mm -hmm. loses, uh, the state loses, the consumer loses, and my employees lose. And this is all being done because they're making decisions off of special interests. It's not being, it's not Thank decisions you. being made of what Thank really you, Bradley. Oh. Sorry, Ray, I just wanna have you wrap it up if you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> no, I thank you for your support. I'm just telling you, the agriculture business is in trouble. Thank you, Ray, and thanks for being such a, a stalwart advocate for your industry. I know you feel like you have no other choice uh, than to do that. And uh, we recognize uh, how important the agriculture industry is to New York State uh, and, and continue to, to work with you. And we'll continue to work with you to make sure that uh, we have our viable small businesses because our farms are small uh, family businesses like yours. 
uh, not the ones you see on Netflix documentaries that kind of tend to run the narrative. Uh, but, but we know it's a $6 billion industry across our state and we have a lot more work to do to support it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ray. And next up we have Deirdrick Gehring. So Deirdrick, I'm gonna now let you put your video on and ask you to unmute. We had you before, Dietrich. How about now? There we go. All right. Uh, well, continuing on with agriculture um, here, uh, I want to thank uh, the Senator and the Assemblywoman for their continued support of um, Indian Ladder Farms and New York State Agriculture. Uh, you've both been uh, great supporters of, of both. Um, I'm here actually today uh, representing the New York State Hop Growers. Um, we uh, are working with uh, Cornell in order to start a program uh, of hop breeding in New York State so that we can um, be competitive out there in the world of hops. Um, New York State uh, has a lot of small farms um, that have had to diversify over the years. Hops is one of the um, ways to do that. Uh, but to stay competitive, we really need to have uh, the ability to um, grow uh, some of the flavor profiles and so on in hops that the brewers are asking for um, that uh, command higher prices. Uh, so we've put together, New York State Hop Growers have put together what we think is a very good team out at Cornell with uh, head by uh, Dr. Larry Smart. And uh, we are currently working with them and getting them material in order to start this breeding program. Uh, there was a line item, which I know we've talked about a little bit, um, that was left out of the governor's budget. And we're just uh, trying to make sure that that gets uh, reinstated as we uh, feel pretty passionate about this and uh, would like to see that money uh, put back in as this is a long-term program that we will be doing with Cornell. Dietrich, what what is that line item? Where 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 was that in the budget? Ag and market. Yes, I believe so. Yep, we can, Alyssa. We can send you the info on the the hop. The I think it was two hops lines that were uh, omitted from the executive budget. Right. We'll send you that so you have it. Um, but thank you. Yes, hops is a. Uh, an important and growing industry here in New York, especially uh, both from a product perspective, but also a tourism perspective and agritourism, agri uh, which is a, exactly. a big component for all of our communities. Exactly, and, and again, we, we thank you for uh, your support on this and uh, uh, we, we look forward to uh, the season coming up here. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Great, you. Thank, thank you. All right, our next speaker is Mark Doerr from the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Alliance Association, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on, I just wanna... Oh, there we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, how you doing? First, uh, my name's Mark Doerr, I'm the president with the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association, we're based in Albany, New York. We have a thousand members uh, in the hotel uh, destination marketing uh, industry and also our amusement parks and our attractions. So uh, first I'd like to thank you for having us. Senator Hinchy and Assembly Member Fahey have been so important to our tourism uh, initiatives that we've had. And just to start with a quick story, I won't take too much time. Our chairman of the board, Eric Ridley, and a real little funny, side was the other day I said I was going to be testifying at this uh, budget forum and he said to me he says well Senator Hinchy's dad was the person who gave me my first ever job out of college he got out of college and he worked on a campaign uh, for Senator Hinchy's father so small world uh, he's out of uh, <laughs> Syracuse area now but I just wanted to share that and say it's a small world and everybody's kind of wrapped into tourism and, and politics in some way our, our uh, budget asks are very simple and Senator Hinchy and Assembly Member Fahey are very aware of them because they've been the champions for this number one issue, which is our matching grants program. Basically uh, our CVBs and DMOs put up money to market and promote their region. 
the state then through a process of applying matches that dollar for dollar. So last year, uh, 2.45 million was in the governor's budget and Senator Hinchy got that back, a million dollars back for us to, to bring it back to 3.4 million. Uh, we're asking for the same thing again this year. It's money well spent. Uh, Senator, the money that was in last year's budget allocated at the 3.4 million has already been distributed this year. That money gets distributed in the next year. So they've already got their money. They're starting to market. They're starting to promote, which is just a huge benefit coming out of the pandemic. As we know, tourism was really the hardest hit when you put the restaurants in with us and our hospitality, hardest hit industry. So uh, that's really important to us if the Senate and both the Assembly can can ask to get that $1 million in the final budget would be would be huge. Our industry is a $115 billion industry, as we know. And even that million dollars uh, really turns into $2 million because our members match that money to market and promote. And it's done on a regional basis. So thank you for last year and a hope for this year. Uh, very important for us. The other thing, and I know this is uh, Assemblymember Fahey and Senator Hinchy also, uh, the short-term rental business that's going on, that's kind of an unlevel playing field. Those are your Airbnbs and your VRBOs. And our industry uh, is supportive of those businesses. The only thing is we would like them to be able to collect the state occupancy sales, safety and security. During the pandemic, obviously, our members were basically shut down. They're doing 10 to 20% occupancy without any regulation or collection of taxes from the short-term rentals, they were booming and doing a great business better than they've done for many, many years. So uh, our hope is in the state budget and also legislatively later on is to have sales tax, occupancy tax, safety and security. Uh, the governor had sales tax collection in her budget, but it only collected from the platform. So that doesn't really solve the problem as you both know, because you still don't know who is renting the business and how much money they're taking in. So we have talked to the Senate uh, and Senator Kruger a few times who chairs finance, and she would like to see this, the assembly member Fahey bill and that language be pushed forward into the state budget. So it's a big heavy lift. We've been working on it. I will close by just saying we would like the legislature to look at it as the way that it was handled for the ride sharing, your Ubers and Lyfts, basically what we're looking for the state to do in our industry with the short-term rentals. And that is my uh, presentation and a huge thank you to both of you, huge supporters of tourism. And we always look forward to working with you. Thank you. And so to just to confirm, because the budget, the, as you said, the uh, executive's budget had one taxing structure, but you are happier with the um, the, with the the full taxing structure that is in Assemblymember Fahey's bill, right? There, that, that covers it. There's nothing else that's left out of there. Correct. There's nothing left out of that, Senator. And the, the main problem with the collecting of the sales tax in the governor's budget is it collects from the platforms, but there's no registration process. So they could just say, you know what, we sold in the state, you know, 10 million rooms for $10 million and we'll just send the state a check. So without any checks and balances, which kind of mirrors what the some of the counties have those uh commitments or agreements where the short-term rentals say, you know, we think we send you a check for $800,000 without any backup or any way to audit them. And when you look at the data that comes in, you know, the 800,000 should probably be 3 million for the county. So there's that registration mechanism. So, uh, which we'd be looking for long-term. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next panelist, Gail Volk from the League of Women Voters of Albany County. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, uh, the, it's nice to meet you. And uh, hello, Alyssa. Um, I serve as the League of Women Voters of Albany County Advocacy Director, and I'm also a member of the State League's Committee for Criminal Justice Reform. The League is a nonpartisan organization that's been a leading voice for voter advocacy throughout its 100-year history. In 2021, the legislature passed a law to lower the number of voters designated to early voting poll sites and extend poll site hours of operation during early voting. 
These reforms will strengthen the early voting process for many voters, but only if counties have the resources for staffing and equipment to be able to implement them. The burdens that the county boards face in 2022 are similar to those faced in 2019, at which time they received $10 million in aid to localities and 25 million in capital funding. The League urges the legislature to include these amounts when introducing their proposed budgets and to consider setting up a yearly fund specifically for enhanced election reforms. The League also supports the restoration of the Tuition Assistance Program, or TAP, for people who are incarcerated. The League sees a direct connection between providing college programs at all New York State prisons and these vital benefits to incarcerated people, our prison system, and our society. First, individuals who are incarcerated would have a better chance to develop through higher education. With articulated goals and a growing sense of self-awareness, these behind the bar students develop themselves in ways unavailable to them before confinement. Second, education provides release individuals a greater chance at success by smoothing reentry. Education reduces the recidivism and dependency that often undermines incarcerated women, 73% of whom are mothers and their ability to thrive, rise the next generation of engaged citizens and maintain economic independence. And third, investing in the development of individuals is a way of decreasing prison populations and remedying, remedying the inequities of our public education system and consequences of years of policies that led to mass incarceration for people of color. The release of these funds would account for less than 1% of the overall TAP budget and would save New York State between 22 million and 27 point million dollars. TAP restoration not only rehabilitates and empowers those who are incarcerated, it increases their chances for returning to productive lives and improved outcomes for our next generation. I wanted to thank you for your time and attention. Um, and I'm out of time, so I can't keep going on. <laughs> I can send you the full budget. There are four items uh, that we have. Yes, please send those over. We'll we'll look at them. As we said, we're collecting written testimony in a, a longer forum, so I appreciate it. Um, but the two points you raise are very important, so thank you for, for advocating for them today. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Gail. Um, and our next speaker is Larry Krajewski from the Catskill Mountain Housing Development Corporation. Mute. <laughs> Hi, thank you for this opportunity. Hi, Larry. Um, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Larry Krajewski and I'm the executive director of Catskill Mountain Housing Development Corporation. We provide housing assistance to the residents of Greene County as their rural preservation company. I'm asking for your support for the Rural Preservation Company Program. Uh, this program provides us with vital core financial support for our agency. It allows us to participate in a variety of home repair, trailer replacement, and community development programs. The New York State Rural Advocates have recommended an increase in the budget to $6.25 million to fund an increase to $100,000 for each of the 60 rural preservation companies that serve rural communities across New York State. Uh, we also support all of the budget recommendations from the New York State Rural Advocates, which includes increases for the Affordable Housing Corporation, the Restore and Access to Home programs, the New York Main Street programs, and other programs vital to our mission and the mission of our fellow rural preservation companies. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Larry, so much. And I'll uh, say everyone's being so very efficient with their time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. We're, we're running a little early, which I was surprised by. Um, but I will say thank you for, for uh, advocating for rural housing, too. Uh, we know that we're in a, a housing crisis. And a lot of the issues and a lot of the things that we typically fund in the budget help more urban areas with housing. They quite often don't um, fund or help our communities. 
uh, yes. with, with uh, housing initiatives. Many of the ones that you've said have been, uh, you know, not funded for years. Uh, and so it's it's really important that we do that now to make sure that uh, the housing issues uh, across our state are being covered because it doesn't matter where you live, we're facing a housing shortage. Well, thank you for your support. Thank you. Great, thank you, Larry. Um, next up, we have Jonathan Brady um, from the from Climate Reality Project. Hi, good morning. I don't seem to be able to get my, oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Good morning. Good morning. So yes, hi, my name is Jonathan Brady. I live in the village of Elka Park in Greene County, and I'm a member of Climate Reality, uh, Hudson Valley and Catskills. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Senator Hinchy for being a co-sponsor of the All Electric Buildings Act. Uh, buildings account for one third of all greenhouse gases uh, emissions in New York State. And so it's really important that we get these under control. Um, there are four other bills which taken together uh, make up a package called the Renewable Heat Now legislative package. Um, the other bills have um, fairly unglamorous names like the Advanced Buildings Appliance and Equipment Standards Act. Um, I would note Assemblymember Fahey uh, is not my assembly member. I wish you were, um, but I would thank you for being the sponsor of that and also the sponsor of the um, uh, Gas Transition and Affordable Energy Act. So that's S8198. And the other ones of interest are the uh, Fossil Free Heating Tax Credit and Sales Tax Exemption. So that's S3864 and S642A. Um, and taken together in combination with the All Electric Buildings Act, this package provides uh, the financial incentives necessary and, and the regulatory uh, changes necessary for us to make a rapid transition away from fossil fuels in our buildings. So uh, please advocate for these to be included in the budget. Um, I have two young daughters and I would love for them to grow up and live in a world and in an environment where they can thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will make sure if you have not sent it to us already and we'll, we'll make sure that we get that list of uh, bills that you just uh, cited as well so that we can uh, disseminate. I will send them by email. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. And as always, thank you to Assembly Member Fahey for sponsoring so many of our great climate initiatives. We uh, count on you as a great partner. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Next up, we have Barbara Todd from the New York Alliance for Developmental Disabilities. I'm unmute, okay, hi, can you hear me there? Yes, hello. Hi. Hello, I'm speaking from the uh, from NIAD, New York Alliance for Developmental Disabilities. I'm talking to you today about the DSP workforce emergency. My son Joe is 28. He's in a Westchester group home. He's a non-speaking individual with Down syndrome and autism. He loves his direct service professionals. Those DSPs are his lifeline. They're his voice, not just giving him his meds, but taking him to day program, taking him to the doctor. Uh, wiping his butt, which you can't do. So he, and you talk to him about, you know, Victor and Michelle, the people that are working with him and his face lights up. We need DSPs. I've sat in on many of these OPWDD forums where they talk about wonderful programs. And last year I sat in on five forums In every single forum, we parents, guardians, siblings, we told them the same thing. We don't want to hear about your programs, but we, we want to hear that you're funding those direct service professionals. Now, Senator Mannion has just proposed a $500 million recurring increase to the budget for DSPs. I don't think people realize what OPWDD has been doing since 2009. The, the number of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities has just been increasing exponentially. But since 2009, and, and I spoke to your father about this years ago, I was in Sullivan County for 34 years, and currently a member, a, a resident of Greene County. Since 2009, OP, OPWDD has been closing group homes, 
and cutting services. And as a former Medicaid service coordinator, I went toe to toe with them for 25 years. Please stop doing this. Why are you cutting this? Why are you closing that home? In the past year, they've closed 115 group homes. Moving, and what happens to those individuals? They're moved into more institutional settings. This is, this is so important for these individuals. I don't think people realize it's not just that autism is increasing, neurological complications are, are on an exponential uprise. And it's the, the need for these direct service professionals, they truly are our lifeline. We can't bake them enough brownies for all they do and they can't live on a minimum wage salary. It's nice to give them a $3,000 bonus. That's a one-time thing. It's nice to, to give them a COLA, but that 5.4% COLA works out to a 65 cents per hour increase. You try living in New York City on $16 an hour, which is what they make there. We have DSPs driving a long way to, to get to work. They can't afford it. They're leaving the field in droves. They love our children. They're dedicated. They can't afford to stay. Their pay needs to be a minimum of $20 an hour. And that's the same figure that Senator Mannion arrived at. Without those DSPs, you have no programs, no group homes, no services. We really applaud uh, Senator Mannion, Assemblyman. The, the, I'm sorry, I'm getting nervous now. But there, there are so many wonderful- You're doing great. Your, your dad was one of them too. He, he and his staff were very helpful. And hearing our, our, our need is so great. Please help Joe and his buddies. They, they treasure the little bit of independence, that feeling of being, Joe loves to be like his siblings. He's living with other guys. He's going to the day program and working a job. He sees that as just like his older brother who's living with some buddies, going out and working jobs. Their dignity, their quality of life. To see these, these young men and women frightened with the possibility of being homeless. Because you take away their homes were closed on Christmas day. We have almost 10,000 members of NIAD and I get calls almost every day in the past year, people saying they're closing this home. They're not, they're not regarding their civil rights. They're not regarding legal statutes, regulations. They're not giving them any kind of notice or, or choice. And this, it's, it's a heartbreaking situation. We ask, please look at this. Please look at this in the budget. We need the DSPs in order to have the services, in order to have the group homes. We need these people and they need a decent pay. Thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for raising this. This is incredibly important. And I'll just add, uh, you know, we I've learned a lot more about OPWDD and the challenges, uh, we'll say, uh, with the agency of, of recognizing we had a, a constituent here in Ulster County who uh, had a TBI and she and her family, I think are actually on the forum today, uh, had to leave uh, our community because the services were not offered. The services that she needed were not offered here. Uh, no one should have to leave their community. We need to be able to provide services uh, for the people that need them, especially when we have an agency that is tasked with doing so. Uh, and so thank you for, for advocating for, for your son and for so many others uh, in this space. Uh, and Senator Mannion is a, a great ally. You know, he has his own uh, personal experiences uh, with his son too, and, and I think has seen firsthand uh, the need and importance of DSPs. So, and, and keeping them funded, we, we're realizing that all of many, uh, if not all, of our care workers uh, across the board have been quite literally shortchanged uh, for a very long time, and that sends ripple effects uh, for years to come in our communities. So, thank you very much for for raising this. Thank you, Senator. Great, thank you, Barbara. Um, and next up, we have Lori Wheelock from the Public Utility Law Project. Thank you, and good morning, Senator Hinchy, and thank you, Assemblymember Fahey's office, for the opportunity to testify at today's budget forum. My name is Lori Wheelock. I'm the Deputy Director and Counsel for the Public Utility Law Project. We go by PULP for short. We're a 40-year-old nonprofit that's dedicated to educating litigating and advocating on behalf of New York State's low-income residential utility customers. So we advocate on the state and federal level when it comes to policy proceedings. We actually become parties when, for instance, Central Hudson requests a rate increase. And we also work with your constituent services teams to offer direct assistance from everything from deferred payment agreements to service quality concerns. 
But today my testimony focuses on the reality facing so many low-income customers across the state, economically struggling to determine what to pay next and what to pay first. In New York State, our electric and gas utilities are required to file monthly reports that allows us to see how people are doing when it comes to paying their energy bills. And as of January 2022, we have 1.3 million households behind on their electric and gas bills for a total of $1.7 billion that's owed. This month, electric and gas customers are also getting their bills and seeing a massive surge because of the commodity issues on the federal level. We've had National Grid Upstate customers and Central Hudson customers contacting us with bills that are two to three times higher than they were last month. One Central Hudson customer showed us a bill that was $250 last month, only to be $900 now. So our message is simple. We need the state to come up with a uniform, common sense plan to address the utility arrears crisis and have that work through the New York State budget. So a few action items we wanted to share today is that we're encouraging the state to pass an extension of a moratorium on essential utility shutoffs as supported by Senator Parker's bill S7668. It would put a brief uh, utility service moratorium in place until June 30th, 2022. So just June of this year, this gives individuals more time to apply for financial assistance. We've heard stories where, you know, the ERAP funds for utilities haven't been released necessarily yet, or people are waiting for their home energy assistant payment grants to hit. And so we need more time to make sure that people don't lose service. We also need the state to come up with a common sense, broader approach on what to do with this large arrears. And so the next ask is that the state appropriate 1.25 billion of the Federal American Rescue Plan funds to go directly to low and moderate income energy customers. So this will protect their accounts for termination while also lessening their financial stress, allowing them you know, greater ability to, to pay rent and mortgage and food and medicine and not worry as much about the utility arrears debt that has accumulated. Next, we need the utilities to forgive some. So having the legislature require arrears management plans where the utilities forgive a portion of the energy arrears, and then anything that's left over after financial assistance has been applied, the utility forgives a portion, anything left over should go into an affordable, affordable payment agreement that gives that individual time to pay it back without worrying that they're gonna lose their service. And so that's our plan for the energy utilities. There's also non-energy. So for water, internet, cable, and telephone, we're asking that the legislature create a $200 million sales tax program that will allow utilities to forgive some of the debt by applying for tax credits. And this is because unlike the energy utilities, we don't know how far behind water customers are or internet, cable, and telephone are, but we've got to assume it's quite a bit with everything that's going on financially. So last week, Pulp and AARP worked together on a joint letter that was sent to Speaker Hasty and Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. I will drop that into the chat, but it encompasses all of the asks that I've brought today. And we thank you so much, Senator. We thank you, uh, Team Fahey, for allowing us to speak today. We look forward to partnering, partnering with you and um, coming up with a, a real solution to help people. Thank you very much, Lori. No, we know uh, these increases of utility bills right now have skyrocketed and most of our uh, community members cannot pay these increases. Uh, we have to find out what happened. Uh, it looks like these companies did not hedge in the way that they were supposed to back in October. And now uh, all of us are bearing the run uh, of that poor practice. So uh, please send us over that, that full list. Uh, very interested in seeing that. And just, I believe you may know this, but we did pass the uh, extension of the moratorium for utility shutoffs. We did pass that out of committee uh, just uh, a week or two ago. And so uh, that is on a, a good track, I believe. But uh, thank you for, for sending us the rest of these and we'll, we'll make sure we look into them. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Assemblywoman's Office. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, so Evelyn, White Bay, you're up next, but we didn't we didn't see you in the attendees. So if you are in the attendees, could you please raise your hand if your name is not correct? All right. Um, so I think we're gonna skip ahead since we're running a little bit early. I think a few people are not quite on yet. Uh, and but I do see Linnean Davis on, who um, is a constituent that just wanted to speak about more funding for libraries. 
So Linnea, we will bring you over now. Hello, now we just need you unmuted. I'm trying to do it as we speak. Okay. There you go. Hi, hi, my name is Mark. This is my wife, Linian. Um, oh. I'm actually speaking as a citizen and also a member of the board of trustees of our local town library, um, advocating for continued financial support for the libraries in the state. Um, libraries fulfill a very strong emotional uh, factor in the town's health and also provide financial support to people who otherwise would not be able to do things as simple as buying a book or downloading a movie. Um, this 2022 budget for the town was increased by 10% and to some degree on the shoulders of a 5% decrease in the library budget. So I am advocating for some continued support. I think there is, it's partially due to the fact that a library, although it's chartered by the New York State Board of Regents and must comply with New York State education law, its funding is almost entirely from the town taxpayer budget. Um, the thing that may not be understood is that for every dollar that an individual taxpayer spends, they can recover that in tangible goods by not buying a book, by borrowing a book, by going online and downloading a movie. Um, and that the simple fact of borrowing a book a month would recover all the money spent by the individual taxpayer. The library also functions as a meeting place for everything from quilting groups to gun safety groups. Um, seniors who attend either via Zoom or in-person yoga classes once a week, chair yoga, can recover hundreds of dollars a year. They can save hundreds of dollars a year by attending these classes for free at the library. Um, it's, it's a tangible return on investment that uh, not all taxpayers see through their other, other tax contributions. Um, I think libraries need financial assistance to recover some of these losses, but also verbal advocacy from local and statewide leadership uh, to remind people the value of having a library. Um, cutting 5% a year from the library budget would only take a couple of years for the library not to be able to open. Loss of the library, I think once it happens, would be very difficult to replace. I understand the importance of everything that everyone else has been speaking about. You, you can't live without clean water, uh, arable soil, breathable air. But there is the library serves a real function and basically can pay for itself. And I want to thank you for your time for allowing me to speak. Thank, thank you. you. Um, oh. As a former elected uh, member of the Albany Public Library Board of Trustees, uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of state funding for library systems. So in New York State, libraries are funded through the systems in, in our region here in Albany, it's the Upper Hudson Library System. And those systems uh, which cover the entire state serve as a, an incredible example of municipal cooperation. Um, and it's because when you when you want a when you want a library book and it's not at your library, you're able to request it from an associated library through the systems. They serve um, to uh, share all kinds of resources, and it is it is our 
um, thought that this is an incredible um, opportunity to learn how best to share municipal resources, because these systems really figure out uh, who's got what and who needs what and how do we get it to people. Uh, libraries, uh, uh, Pat's predecessor here in the assembly was Assemblyman John McDonald, and he was fond. He's our local historian here at the uh, New York State Assembly. And uh, he was very fond of calling libraries the University of the Streets. This is the place where it's a neutral situation. People come, I don't know if you know that uh, uh, libraries are the first destination for people to go and research or ask questions about a medical diagnosis that they've just received. It's a trusted resource to ask our most important questions and they remain uh, you know, the center, the third place in our cultures. So the funding in New York State, one is for the system and that's very, that's absolutely important because that gets redistributed to your local libraries. And then the second part is um, uh, construction funds. And this is to help our infrastructure, our library infrastructure. Many of our libraries are quite old. There was a huge investment a hundred years ago and now there needs to be um, upgrades to that. So thank you for bringing this important issue up. May I, may I just build on the outreach of the library? We have residents who are active duty military deployed overseas and they access the library online from their postings. So even when they leave town, the local library does play a big part in their lives. And thank you again. Yeah, thank, thank you. And of course, broadband, as we, you know, we talk about all the time, is kind of the place that people went to in the, the pandemic. Can you uh, mention which uh, local library is yours that you, you frequent? Cairo Public Library. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees there. Thank you very much, Karen. It's a great Cairo. library. It is, if I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thank you both so much uh, for advocating for, for our libraries. You. You've got some also great champions in uh, Senator Ryan in our house too, uh, but really important community institutions. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you both. Um, next up, we have Lara Casper Bukarev, sorry if I mispronounced that, from Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. As noted, my name is Laura Casper Bukareff, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of Legal Services of the Hudson Valley, or LSHV. I am also a constituent residing within the town of Lloyd in Ulster County. Thank you for your continued support of LSHV, the only provider of comprehensive free civil legal services to low-income and vulnerable individuals and families in Ulster, Dutchess, Orange, Sullivan, Westchester, Putnam, and Rockland counties. In Ulster County alone, we have a high demand for our services. 25% of residents are eligible. In 2021, LSHV handled 11,984 cases in the Hudson Valley, impacting a total of 27,376 household members. LSHV's testimony today will focus on five key budgetary issues. First, please support adding funding of $10.6 million to the governor's proposed $14.4 million to maintain stable funding to all current providers of attorney services for crime victims through Office of Victim Services for the next two years. In December, 2021, LSHV, like many other providers, was forced to immediately shutter intake and put a freeze on hiring for new positions because OVS notified all providers that because of a decline in federal VOCA funding coming to New York, it would be terminating the attorney services contracts one year early, effective September 2022. Second, we ask for your continued support of LSHV's Veterans and Military Families Advocacy Project, 
Last year, through an allocation of $200,000, this program served 872 veteran and military families with critical civil legal issues. Third, restoration of and increased funding for civil legal services through the Legal Services Assistance Fund, LSAF, a critical funding stream for civil legal services programs. LSHV receives $151,667 from that fund, which supports an elder law attorney who covers Ulster County and is responsible for the creation of our LGBTQ unit. Fourth, increasing the governor's proposed $20 million in funding with an additional 15 million for the homeowner protection program, which will prevent foreclosures in zombie properties and stabilize Hudson Valley communities. Fifth, we urge you to support restoration of funding for the Disability Advocacy Project at the same level, $3 million as last year. This program gets disability benefits, SSI and SSD for constituents and saves counties and New York state money because people are getting off state and local funded public assistance benefits. Thank you very much and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. We're mostly just listening today for people to, uh, to bring in uh, their, their points and time that we really appreciate everything uh, that, that you do and your organization does. It's, it's really important in uh, confirming you'll send over also all of the, the line out asks uh, that you have today. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Great. And next up, we have uh, Jeremy Cherson from Riverkeeper. Oh, sorry. Let me. Oh, yeah, he's still there. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Senator. Can you see? Can you see me? We got you, Jeremy. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? We're doing well. Well, I really thank you for hosting this this forum. I think it's so important that uh, these local budget forums uh, happen so members of the community can can directly address uh, their state legislators. Um, uh, as an organization that is very active in your district, as well as assembly member Fahey's district, uh, there are three items that I would like to highlight in the budget. Uh, a couple of which you're probably very well acquainted with. with. Um, the first is the DEC's Hudson River Estuary Program, uh, which was created in 1996 with a budget of $6 million. Uh, thus far, uh, the program has funded tributary tree plantings all over the Hudson Valley, uh, brought down dams uh, across the Hudson Valley to reconnect streams and rehabilitate wildlife, uh, including our migratory fish, and have also helped communities such as Kingston revitalize their waterfront, uh, such as with renovations at the Hudson River Maritime Museum uh, and other projects that bring tourism dollars to local communities. Since 1996, it has only grown by $500,000, even though our population has soared and the needs and responsibilities of the, ag of the agency's program has increased. I wanna thank uh, the assembly member for leading a letter in the assembly, uh, asking for a $2 million increase for this program and uh, for you, Senator, signing on to a letter in your house, uh, asking the same of uh, the Senate's one house budget to include an increase for this important program. Another new, uh, uh, one new program uh, that we are highlighting uh, with our partners at the Hudson Seven Drinking Water Communities that are uh, the town of Esopus, Lloyd, Hyde Park, city and town of Poughkeepsie, and the village and town of Rhinebeck is a $250,000 phase one study with the US Geological Survey to study climate change and how it's going to impact the Hudson River salt front. We know that sea level rise is moving the salt front, which is currently around Wappingers Falls, depending on uh, drought conditions uh, and dam releases further upriver, uh, but climate change may raise the seas uh, and bring more salt northward, potentially impacting the drinking water intakes uh, for these seven communities 
and New York City's backup drinking water supply, which is near Wappingers Falls. Uh, we really need to get started on this type of study uh, because impacts could start around 2040 or 2045 uh, with the latest projections. Uh, and so I have more information about that in my testimony, as well as the Hudson 7 is putting in uh, testimony as well, from, specifically from uh, that intermunicipal coalition. And then lastly, um, we are strongly supporting the governor's proposal for freshwater wetlands reform, part QQ, these in the, in the Article 7 TED. These are natural climate solutions. Uh, and we have already lost more than 90% of New York's uh, wetlands since colonization. And it is very important uh, that we uh, 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 include the governor's reform uh, in the budget uh, because it will save the Department of Environmental Conservation hundreds of thousands of dollars per year uh, in costs uh, and also save towns from flooding impacts. And so, uh, I think I've run out of time, but I thank you so very much for hosting this forum and look forward to continuing to work with your office. We're right on time. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, and, and thank you for all those. Yes, it's all very, very important protecting the Hudson River and, and thinking about those waterways uh, are incredibly important. So thank you so much. And we look forward to uh, seeing more details within the written testimony. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and next up, we have Evelyn Whitebay from uh, Dyslexia and Literacy Learning Consultants. So Evelyn, you'll just need to unmute and start your video. You should be seeing requests for both of those. All right. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay. Thanks so much. Hello. Um, hi. And thank you so much for uh, hosting this senator and assembly member. Um, and also, oh dear, I forgot that part. Um, the uh, I'll just get started here if you don't mind. Um, in the COVID era, equity, learning loss, emotional learning, and health, low income, and poverty largely in communities of color, and issues affecting high-risk groups, including dyslexics, remain problems to overcome and address effectively. As we come out of this critical era, or this critical period, rather, um, we enter another critical period regarding education of our learning disabled, general education, and all student and marginalized populations to meet the needs of teachers and students coming out of the COVID era and in recovery from pre-existing conditions and COVID-related setbacks. Let's work together to put supportive measures into the budget, form a coalition to focus on teacher development so they meet the needs of the children and receive proper teacher training around literacy and unfinished learning. So the teachers will actually have the knowledge to teach children how to read, write, and spell. There's a call to action, develop a manifesto. Since too many problems have existed for neglect, too many children diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, um, too much unfinished learning, too little and not enough dyslexia literacy trained teachers, unlike other states, um, and too many literacy needs that are not being met, especially when those are taught through reading programs that are more philosophy than functional. Um, also, 20% of the federal funds are required to go to learning loss, unfinished learning, and, but we can do better in New York State. These are federal funds um, that I'm talking about. The dyslexics also need help. There's more asks. Include items in the budget that will support effectively addressing learning loss, unfinished learning, pre-existing learning gaps, and dyslexia literacy. If we understand how to spend our money to access equity issues, we can decrease the negative effects of learning loss in the COVID era 
address unfinished learning, social emotional plus uh, issues, plus decrease the surf tax on New York State taxpayers as a result of low gain reading philosophies and models under the federal AARP, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, GEAR, HEAR, and CARES Act, then the CRRSA funds. We now have the funds to actually do what we've wanted to do for many years, which is more teacher training, plus current, address current learning loss and unfinished learning. We can have targeted before school and after school and during school tutoring programs, as well as teacher training with high gain results, um, which are needed to close pre-existing gaps, um, less budget and spend our money, and also pass the bills for these things in both the Senate and the Assembly um, to spend our money wisely on teacher training to train, train, child, um, to train children with updated accelerated high gain programs supported, supported by the FXC of peer reviewed scientific controlled randomized studies and trials. We can do better in New York State. Thank you, if you have any questions. And also I got to put a plug in for the, the libraries. The libraries have been wonderful in supporting um, this new uh, focus and awareness around dyslexia. And um, I can't thank the Platykill Library and the system there enough. They're wonderful. It's really been a lifesaver for um, children and parents who are, are um, struggling because their children are not learning to be functional in school. Absolutely, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Evelyn. And, and it's true, drawing those connections between so many of the services in our libraries is, is really important. So thank you for speaking up on behalf of both. Uh, and yes, I think, you know, we, we can do a lot better in a lot of places uh, in New York State. And hopefully, you know, this is a unique uh, year where we do have a lot of federal funds coming to uh, coming to the state, a lot of competing priorities. All of them are important, but we have to be thoughtful and smarter about how we, uh, especially yes. how we direct those federal funds and how we make sure that the money is really going to people uh, and not just administrative uh, pieces. Yes, and the Learning Disabilities Association of New York also thanks you as well. Assemblywoman Fahey has uh, been particularly concerned about the accumulated learning loss um, in, uh, in our district and across the state um, yes. and has been asking for, you know, for how we're actually determining that and collecting that information. Um, and, yep. you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is, we were concerned about it before COVID. We, you know, now it's, crisis proportions and the yes. kind of um, alternative uh, learning opportunities that you encourage and train for are, are absolutely important. Dyslexia uh, is a complicated um, uh, process and, um, and libraries can be really important. Uh, my kids certainly carried around books way longer than uh, before she could read. Uh, and it was really important that she had relationships with books. She certainly loved those stories. She couldn't quite read them herself, but. Um, yeah, if you so want more, you. Inf you're so welcome. And if you want more information, because we're working on platforms to be able to understand how the funding is coming down to the state, how it's um, being distributed and what the allowable uses are. So we're doing a lot in that area on a different platform. So if you, you feel, for, please, feel free to, um, uh, reach out to us because we're going to be having a series of workshops on that and That's presentations. Very Thank you. Yeah, and from and we're getting people from the Department of Education in Washington as well as New York State people. So great. I would say as you have that information, as you, as you compile it, please send it over oh. to us. It'd be it'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. If great. I can be Thanks. a service. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> We love oh, so thank you so much, Evelyn. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Kevin Kebany uh, from the Hudson Valley National Center for Veteran Reintegration. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I'd like to thank Senator Hinchy and Assemblywoman Fahey for, um, for giving our organization the, um, the opportunity to be a voice for our veterans. Um, the Hudson Valley National Center for Veteran Integration works to empower military men and women enabling them to successfully 
successfully return to civilian life and lead fulfilling lives. The mission of the center is to provide support for both our current military personnel, whether we're home on leave or to our veterans and their families. Um, we do all work through supporting the well-being of veterans through purpose, dignity, respect, and honor. The center works to not only enhance the quality of life of the military veterans, but to give them the programs and services they need to survive in our communities, especially the ones in which they work, and have worked so hard to, to preserve um, through the military service. The center offers veterans programs that facilitate every aspect of transitioning back into civilian life through career employment transition programs, financial literacy, strategies, classes in social reintegration, substance abuse assistance, and our integrative mental health programs all of which are free to any, any participant that comes through our doors. Um, our center encompasses the intergenerational peer-to-peer -peer programs, such as the Veterans Women Boat Workshop. Uh, the kayaks built in these workshops serve as a tool of healing, um, where they focus on creativity um, in a comfortable environment that allows veterans to rest and reset with their peers. Our center's environment replicates the positive aspects of, military of the military community through occupational therapy, camaraderie, fellowship, and peer-to-peer -peer support. Regardless of the veteran socioeconomic situation, they're in a safe space here at the center. We don't judge, we accept all. Wherever possible, we assist. No conversation is taboo if it's a conversation that helps to heal. Um, our main goal is to work together to enhance the quality of life for other veterans, regardless of their individual personal struggle, whatever their personal individual struggles may be. Um, these programs are always free to our veterans. However, we cannot provide them without funding. The last couple of years have been um, extremely difficult for us because of the pandemic and COVID. Um, like many other organizations, we are struggling. So we're asking for your help to help us continue helping our veterans by helping us raise the funds to keep our programs operational. We do a lot on the shoestring, and I think a lot of times um, folks don't realize how much it actually costs to provide these services. While it's a drop in the bucket when you look at the, the state's budget, it's extremely significant to a small organization like ours. Our wooden boat workshop is currently suspended because we're looking for $25,000 to finish building out our workshop, our workspace center. No veterans are going through that program right now. A kayak building program, something we're very well known for. Those kayaks cost us on average $3,500 per participant. That comes out of donations through the community. It's it's average funding requirements for this. Bear with me as I'm trying to go over some of these numbers. So every class we have between four and six veteran participants runs around twenty one thousand dollars. Our wellness program is seeking almost ten thousand dollars just for materials and supplies, so we can provide our veterans programs such as yoga, wellness, mindfulness, getting outdoors, and hiking. Um, our Equin program, which is annual costs are projected around $46,500, let alone operations to keep the lights on. Um, we are counting on you and your support to assist um, receiving these fund funding so organizations like ours can continue to serve our veteran community. Uh, thank you for your time. If anyone has any questions about what we do or how we can do it, please feel free to reach out and provide anything you need, including our um, strategic plan for 2022, 2024. Again, Senator Hanchi, Assemblyman Fahey, thank you so very much for giving us the opportunity to, to be the voice for our veteran community. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And, and thanks for everything that you do. One thing, uh, and we know that it all uh, of course, requires lots of funding and you do really incredible programs. One thing I didn't hear you mention, and I know especially um, Posse for Assembly Member Fahey, what could be interesting is uh, your possible expansion to helping run the Dwyer program uh, across the state. Could you take a moment just to, to go over that briefly? Yes, Senator, thank you. I, I saw that yellow card go up um, from your staff, so I tried to shut that. I know they're they're very diligent. My my team is very diligent. They're doing a great job, but I want to make sure that's a, a Dwyer's important. 
They are great. And thank you for the additional time, Senator. So, yeah, so we are actually, um, um, the, the Joseph P. Dwyer peer-to-peer -peer program actually, you know, so so our, our organization runs that here in Ulster County. We're getting ready to bring it up online in uh, Greene County. More importantly, um, when we first became a part of Dwyer, before actually official uh, Dwyer recipients, we started a coalition. Um, and currently all 25 counties are part of our coalition and we've created a single voice for, for the Dwyer community, um, which is important when you consider that if everything goes right um, and, and not such a, a long period of time, every county in the state of New York is going to have access to the peer, Joseph P. Dwyer peer, peer to peer project. Great, thank you. It's uh, very important to, to have that plug in there too as we're looking at funding in the budget to think through where we can expand that to and how many people that will help across thank the state. Thank you very much. And that is another, it's another program. It's, not, it, it's, it's they, they do a lot. We do a lot on the shoestring budget. So great program, critical to the veteran community. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, up next, we have Drew Andrews from the Center for Creative Education. Hello, Drew. Hi, uh, Senator Henchy, how are you? Doing well, how are you doing? Oh, good, very blessed. Um, I wanna first send my prayers and strength out to Assembly uh, Member Fahey and her family. Um, and she's going through a rough time and I feel, I feel her. Um, I, I'd like to um, say hello to everyone. My name is Bryant Andrews, the director at the Center for Creative Education, a nonprofit um, arts-based community center and uh, childcare center in Midtown Kingston. I'd like to also shout out uh, and thank Senator Hinchy and her team and Team Fahey for allowing me to testify during today's hearing. I'm here to advocate for the children and families of Midtown Kingston, uh, Midtown and Downtown Kingston. Uh, the pandemic has unsettled a lot of things, but has magnified what we knew have already existed, which is that we have a broken system. During the pandemic, a mother in fear that she would lose her job and couldn't feed her children or pay rent was forced to leave her six year old child home alone to care for a four month old infant. Someone reported that mother, CPS went to the home and removed the child from the home. Childcare is very, very expensive. What families have to spend to get quality childcare is really difficult, especially single, low income families. Mothers are forced to choose between working and caring for their children because financially it makes sense. The pandemic had been especially hard for childcare centers and families and absolutely nothing is more important to us than investing in childcare. I'm sure that uh, I can speak for parents and childcare centers uh, when I say we need affordable childcare as a major focus of the spending bill. I'm asking Senator Hinchy to help support affordable childcare in, in this spending plan. It's crucial to our children, it's crucial to our families, communities, and to the workforce. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's true. I have it. We've. I know Assembly Member and I. The Assembly Member and I are uh, support all of the things that we've talked about today and have done uh, a lot of uh, work on them or, or been vocal in this budget section. But uh, we have. Uh, I am very supportive of uh, expanding universal child care much further beyond what the executive has proposed in. Uh, her budget. There's a charge in both of our houses, the Assembly and the Senate, for uh, the $5 billion, which we know is even just a fraction of the budget, but would save so much money, would help so many people. Uh, and, you know, we have to, we'll see how that goes through uh, negotiations, but uh, child care is critically important. And we've, we know we have a labor shortage also, and part of our labor shortage is people unable to go back to work. 
uh, because of either the lack of child care in communities like ours uh, or the cost of the very few options of child care that we do have. Yes. Thank you, Senator Hinchy. Thank you very much, Drew. Hey, thank you so much, Drew. Um, so next up, we have a few folks from Caring Majority. Um, so that I'm going to promote all of you to panelists. Um, and then I know you all have an order you'd like to go in. Um, so we can you can each unmute and um, speak in whatever order you would like. Hello. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Hi, we got you, Keith. All right. Well, I know you know why I'm here, but for everyone listening, um, good afternoon. My name is Keith Gergi. For over 12 years now, I have been eligible for 24-hour split shift personal care services or home care after a spinal cord injury left me paralyzed below the neck. However, receiving the required care, particularly in the last year, has been extraordinarily difficult. Since June of last year, there have been at least 90 12 hour shifts totaling well over 1000 hours that I have not been ha not had a home care worker caring for me. This remains the case on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays and every other Sunday from 9am to 9pm. Hiring and retaining staff is also extraordinarily difficult. I am lucky still to have three workers that have been with me for between five and 12 years in one case. But when they are not here, as I have previously outlined, various family members have covered those hours. I want to highlight the level of commitment and fortitude it takes to care for someone else beyond the ordinary daily routine work of bathing, turning and positioning, dressing and feeding and so on. I literally cannot be left alone. I need to at least be able to be heard and have my needs met at any moment, particularly with the spinal cord injury. Any noxious stimuli like a full bowel or bladder will cause a rise in blood pressure that if left unaddressed would be fatal. This healthcare work is not deserving of minimum wage, yet that is the reality. And as a result, there has been a mass exodus from the field with little to no recruitment occurring to fill the gap. I implore the legislature to include wage increases for home care workers in their one house budget bills through the Fair Pay for Home Care Act. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Michael. Thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you all for listening and hearing. Uh, my name is Michael Solo from Kingston. I'm a senior citizen, a member of the New York Caring Majority. Um, a government's budget is very revealing. It says a lot about who we are, uh, what we care about, who we care about, even do we care. Uh, as Senator Hinchy said at the beginning of this forum, a budget is about our values as a society. And as you've heard from Keith, we're here to talk about how the Fair Pay for Home Care Act will address a terrible crisis. It's a desperate shortage of home care workers. Um, one out of four New Yorkers who need home care cannot find any. And even when people do have home care, uh, a survey showed that three out of four of them struggle to hang on to their workers. And if that isn't a crisis, I don't know what is. The reason is low pay. It's about $13 an hour. That is a poverty wage, below what fast food workers are now required to be paid. So the solution is pretty simple. Raise their pay to a living wage. Uh, through the state's investment in Medicaid and an improved minimum wage, uh, we're asking for $22.50 an hour for these essential workers. This will help us retain Home care workers attract new workers to this growing field and even improve the economy. Uh, how, you ask? When workers are paid a living wage, they can actually get off public assistance and spend more in their own communities. Plus, people with home care support can stay in their own homes, stay out of expensive and frequently unsafe nursing homes, and people with disabilities are able to work and thrive. Now, Governor Hochul did not include fair pay for home care in her budget. However, bipartisan majorities in the Assembly and State Senate are co-sponsors, including the fine representatives here today whom we thank. 
We must get fair pay over the finish line in the final budget negotiations. And we're counting on you, Senator Hinchy, and Team Fahey to help us do just that. We need to put our money where our mouths are. We need to put people first and stem the crisis in healthcare in New York. In short, we need to prove that we care about care. Thank you for listening and for caring. And now I'd like to ask Gemma to conclude our presentation. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Gemma Kalinda, and I just want to tell you a quick, quick but extremely important story about my experiences with finding and obtaining home care workers to care for me. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as a young teenager. And nine years ago, I started using a wheelchair. And six years after that, I needed to, to obtain home care services to help me um, function like any other able-bodied individual. Um, getting out of bed, getting into bed, cooking, showering, and using the bathroom. Simple, right? Simple things? Yeah, but not for me and so many others. Unable to obtain home care services for two years, uh, I ended up exhausting my savings and emptying out my 401k. And so finally, a year ago, I was able to obtain um, services um, via a program working people with disabilities. Um, after being denied earlier because I was literally over income by $38.67. That's right, I said it, $38.67 was worth more than my life. This is, this is absolutely atrocious. And, and this healthcare infrastructure um, that, people have, that people with disabilities and older adults have to live by. So I submit to you, let's sign, um, let, let, let's stop this insane uh, um, process of obtaining home care and, and trying to find home care. And let's make sure that fair pay for home care gets into the 22-23 budget. Let's, let's make this humane decision. It's time to choose people over profit. I implore you to do everything you can do to get fair pay for home care over the finish line and into the budget. Please, legislators, senators, assembly members, everyone, stress to all the other legislators just how important fair pay for home care is for every single New Yorker. It's just the right thing to do. No, let me take that back. It's the only thing to do. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Gemma and Michael and Keith. Uh, appreciate all of your advocacy on this incredibly important issue for all of the reasons uh, you have outlined. We are really hopeful that this is the year, um, be more than hopeful, hopeful feels like too kind of less of a word, but uh, we are fighting for fair pay for home care uh, this year because we know we need it. So uh, thank you all so much for, for your advocacy on this issue too. Thank you all. And now uh, we're gonna have Alyssa, Michael. Oh, sorry, Leah, Alyssa, did you wanna say something? I just wanted to add that uh, here at Team Fahey, we um, consider this issue part of the infrastructure um, investment that we need to make in our um, in our neighbors and our and potentially ourselves, really, if we don't if we don't take this seriously, um, you know, we're all living longer lives. The 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 reality is is that we'll we're probably um, at greater uh, uh, risk of having a disability than dying young. So uh, the truth is is if we haven't figured this out, and with the encouragement uh, that people live in their own homes, we really need to make this uh, work along with issues uh, that we hear from our seniors as well, the supporting uh, projects like the NORC uh, and other uh, community sustainable um, situations, as well as encouraging uh, compassionate care, you know, that that uh, we do need to take care of each other and we do need to rely on each other and um, and and how grateful we are for um, the folks that um, that make this commitment to us. But we can't ask. We can't ask that of them. Uh, they need to make a living. And I see Mike. Hi, Mike. Yep, I was going to say we have Mike Volkman who's a, another advocate on this issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, um... 
I, I'm following Carrie Majority, and uh, they, they spoke a lot about fair pay. Uh, there's another issue involved here in that um, last year, the state health department uh, restricted, they, they adopted a new policy to restrict eligibility for home care. Now, I know a lot of the people who are listening are taxpayers, so I want you to hear all this, because as taxpayers, many of you are getting ripped off when the state takes on policies that reduces the amount of home care that people need because they don't want to pay for it. They say it's too expensive, but if you don't pay for the home care, then you force us against our will unnecessarily into nursing homes and other institutions. And most of us are on Medicaid, so the taxpayers are going to end up paying the bill up to four times as much when people don't need to be there, when we benefit from living at home in homes of our choosing. I've been in this apartment now for 33 years, and if I lose my aid service because of a silly policy, I will be forced against my will into a nursing home. I will lose this apartment and not ever get it back, and you as a taxpayer are going to get ripped off Taxes in New York are so high already as it is. Uh, You don't want that to keep going up and up. But we we, uh, disabled people have been telling governors and legislators and anybody who will listen for the past 50 years, if you just give in to our demands, you'll save billions of dollars so that we can live in freedom and independence. And by the way, policies like this violate federal law. New York State is out of compliance with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. New York State is out of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which had its integration mandate upheld by the Supreme Court in 1999 in the Olmstead decision. You taxpayers are getting ripped off every nanosecond that a disabled person is in an institution where they don't need to be. This violates law, it violates human rights, and I know that the uh, Senator Hinchy and Assemblymember Fahey support us on these issues. Right now, there are only two people standing in the way of uh, adopting these policies for the state, and those two people are Assembly Speaker Carl Heasty and Governor Kathy Hochul. Governor Hochul talks a lot about investing a lot more in the health care system, but she's left out the part about home care. If you invest more in health in home care and community-based services, you may spend a couple of extra million, but, but the alternative is going to cost billions and billions. So if you adopt our if, if you adopt our policies and pass them, then you will you will save billions when even when you give a little more to the investment we have people who are actually doing the work in home care people we trust to come into our homes to touch our bodies they have children too they have rent to pay too this is why we are asking an a reasonable increase to start now at 2250, that's 150% of the minimum wage. To start at that wage now and have annual cost of living adjustments. Please stop forgetting them. They are qualified to do what we need done in our homes. We want these people to stay with us. If they are not being paid a living wage, they don't want to do the job. And that's a clear and present danger to the people who need them, such as me. There's over 200,000 people in New York State who use home care. We don't want to lose it. We shouldn't be forced to lose it. The investment is absolutely necessary. Please convince Governor Hochul and Speaker Heasty to come on board with us and to adopt our policy. Stop listening to the lobbyists from the nursing homes because with all the with all the rhetoric they see about how Thank wonderful you. they are. Thank you, Michael. Want this profit. Thank we you, Michael. Our... Sorry, I just wanted to keep okay. us on time. Thank, Thank you so much for your, for your testimony, though. Yes. Thank you, Michael.
Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. We we agree it's it's critically important. So thank you so much uh, for being here for today and for joining us. Yes. Thank you. Um, and next up, we have Mark Storch thank from you. the Arc Mid Hudson. Ma'am, thank you. Should be moving over as a panelist now, Mark. Okay. Mark, I think while we have you move over, we're gonna go to our next speaker um, and then we'll keep you as a panelist once you're in here. Um, so that will be Brian Mac McCormick from Columbia Green County Sanctuary Movement. So Brian, I'm moving you over as a panelist now. Hi, all. Thank you very much for having me today. My name is Brian McCormick. I am co-executive director of Columbia County Sanctuary Movement. I just want to thank um, Senator Hinchy and Senator or Assemblymember Fahey's staff for joining us today, as well as all of the powerful folks that are uh, joining us as panelists and bringing important issues to our district. Um, as the co-executive director of Columbia County Sanctuary Movement, we are the regional coordinator for the Fund Excluded Workers campaign. The campaign won a historic $2.1 billion excluded worker fund in the New York State budget last year, which provided much needed pandemic relief to excluded workers who were essential to getting us through the pandemic. $2 billion may seem like a lot of money. Uh, these are folks who are ineligible for unemployment despite losing their jobs to the pandemic and also uh, ineligible for any state funding. So it was essential that New York State stepped up in this regard. I also want to use that number to highlight the financial stability that the state the state is currently going through. We have an estimated $10 billion surplus in revenue that was unexpected as of last year, and we're projected to be fiscally sound for the next five years. So as everybody makes these asks um, of the Senator and Assembly member today, we need to keep in mind that there is a large pie and there's enough to go around for everybody. And we need to take care of the people who make this uh, state work, uh, such as many of you on the call today. So one of the reasons I, I come here today representing the Fund Excluded Workers campaign is that we are very happy that New York is leading the way in the country for an excluded worker campaign. We are happy to report that over 130,000 New Yorkers were in receipt of funds from the excluded worker campaign. But we also know, and those funds went to paying landlords uh, outstanding debt, putting food on the table, which created an outstanding multiplier effect and infused much needed money into local economies. But when we look at the distribution of these funds, there is an inequity when it comes to upstate. To give two examples of counties, Albany County had 3,226 applicants for the excluded worker fund and only 54 of them were approved. Uh, Ulster County had 1,068 applicants and only 128 were approved. These numbers have resulted in 45,000 applications being denied solely because of insufficient funding, not because of an individual's el meeting the eligibility and criteria for this fund, but because the fund ran out in just eight weeks after being uh, open. So we are here to say that our community members cannot be essential and excluded any longer. Uh, they were meant to benefit from this program. They're eligible for this program. The fact that there are more monies needed to make sure that every eligible recipient um, is important for us to bring to this budget. And we are requesting not only a $3 billion replenishment of this fund, but we're asking for a permanent resolution. We need to fill the safety gaps that are in our, in our state right now, the social safety net, 
and make sure that not only during a time of pandemic is a fund like this available to exclude workers, which are undocumented folks, people who are sole proprietors, people who are in the cash economy, et cetera, they also need uh, an unemployment fund. So we are asking for the $3 billion replenishment as well as the establishment of a, a excluded no more alternative to unemployment for excluded workers, which I will add, uh, thank you everybody who shared their powerful words on home care. We have a lot of members who are in the home care industry and this would affect. So thank you for your time today and we hope that you will advocate for this in the budget and in the upcoming le legislative session. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for, for being here and for uh, advocating for this issue, this important issue. Great, thank you, Brian. And now um, we have our last speaker with, who is uh, Mark Storch from the ARC Mid-Hudson. You just need to yes. unmute, Mark. Yeah. Okay, how's that? There we Perfect. go, we gotcha. Okay, hi again, I'm Mark Storch. I'm a father of an adult woman with profound autism who lives with the art in a group in an IRA uh, run by the ARC Mid-Hudson. Uh, Jenny, I'm gonna be very personal with this. Jenny's a 45 year old woman with profound autism. She needs complete help with every aspect of her life. She has severe pica, meaning that she will eat inedibles and um, she needs help with every aspect of her living from toileting to eating, to showering, to being safe, to not running out in the street. And um, I gotta say that the people, the DSPs who work with her are working for, uh, I, the only way I can say it is chump change. They're making 13, 30 an hour. They're making, they're doing life and death work every minute of every single day. And they need not just the $15 an hour wage, they need a living wage, the 2250 that many of the previous speakers have talked about would be uh, really great. If they could make that kind of money, we would have more people staying on the job. I know that these people are, um, how would you say this? They're totally dedicated. They have worked during this pandemic, 18 hour shifts. Some of them have had to sleep in the house. Some of them have had to be mandated to stay because of weather conditions where no one else could make it in. And our, my daughter and other people's lives like hers are um, completely dependent on these DF DSPs and we need to retain them by paying them a living wage of like 22.50 an hour would be great and treating them with the respect that they deserve. So that's about all I have to say. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for, for joining and being part of our forum today. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm gonna put you back as a uh, attendee. Thank you, Senator Hinchy. Thank you, Mark. And we'll let uh, Senator Hinchy and Alyssa if you'd like to close. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone uh, who came and testified and advocated on behalf of so many important issues. We are so close to being on time. This was so great. Um, thank you all. And everyone was uh, being so uh, clear and concise in your uh, priorities. I mean, everything from I'll start with the transfer of school food, making sure we get better, healthy, locally sourced food into our schools. Uh, we know that uh, our students are better served when they're eating healthy food, good healthy food habits from the beginning, uh, as well as uh, better ways to learn, being able to educate, uh, take in information uh, and learn to uh, rural housing to, of course, uh, DSPs and fair pay for home care to our libraries and our infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, child care and supporting those who are differently abled and so many others uh, that we heard on this call. These are all really important uh, pieces and important topics that we need to uh, continue to do better and do more uh, in our budget. And you know, this was uh, just a, a forum to to hear them. I will say, uh, I feel really uh, happy because for uh, everything that was said today, you know, we we are advocating on, which is uh, makes it feel. 
uh, good that they're also the priorities of our community. Uh, there's a lot more, uh, and of course, this is just uh, the beginning. We are in these budget conversations now. Uh, please reach out uh, to our office or send over, uh, send in written testimony. Uh, we are collecting that, and uh, all of these uh, are read. They're all really important for us to make sure that as we go to our respective negotiating tables, uh, we are bringing the voices of our communities with us, uh, knowing what, how, where, and when we should prioritize what. And so uh, this has been a really interesting informative, really great form. I want to thank sincerely all of the people who spent time with us today, uh, both our testifiers uh, who are on the front lines of pushing for so many of these uh, incredible changes, whether you were with uh, an organization or a nonprofit or just a community member who wanted to make their voice heard uh, from something that they see in their community, to everyone who joined us uh, to listen and learn a little bit more about the community in which you live. Uh, to hear what other people are, are prioritizing and pushing for uh, and where we need to do better uh, as a state. So I thank you all uh, so much for being here. And Alyssa, I want to turn it over to you for uh, a few remarks as well. Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, you can't help but be uh, you know, touched by the uh, range of issues that we feel and experience passionately in, uh, in our region. We're really fortunate to have such um, strong advocates for the issues that we heard today. Um, uh, this is the kind of work that we do here uh, in uh, the offices of, uh, uh, of people like Assemblywoman Fahey and Senator Hinchy. We listen and we try to gather as much information so that we can inform the, com the larger conversation. Um, and, and this is, these are societal questions, right? How do we balance um, you know, the care of people less um, able than us? And how do we figure out how to incentivize our, our economic situation so that we can continue to move through this COVID situation? You know, the, the, these are big issues. And, and when you're looking at billions of dollars, um, it, it is kind of hard to get a sense of um, where those major priorities, especially when we're looking at issues of climate change. So these kinds of conversations are not just important for our offices, they're also important for each other. So we understand what we're doing in terms of governing and governance and decision-making and how we um, how these issues get um, uh clearer to the decision makers as they move through this. I, I wanna just encourage, I encourage all advocates to do this. This is continuous work. So you're in relationship with us now. We've had this forum. It's been really an amazing venue. We have, we're in relationship, which means that we encourage you to be in contact with us. This is a process, this budget process, we're moving through uh, to April 1st deadline, right? So you can kind of see what's going to happen now. Our uh, legislative uh, priorities are into our um, leadership and now the legislators are going to be doing internal advocacy with their colleagues to get these uh, priorities moving and in those one house budgets. And then those one house budgets get um, negotiated uh, among leadership uh, with these values going forward. So your advocacy hasn't stopped yet. Our advocacy hasn't stopped yet. So uh, we encourage all advocates to be, to, to be knowledgeable about this budget process and, and be back in touch with us. Um, we expect that you'll call us. We expect that we'll get your emails. We expect that you'll remain in relationship uh, with us. This is not a one-shot deal. And in fact, um, you never have to apologize for calling again. Um, we do like friendly calls. Uh, so we appreciate um, those, but uh, please share with us uh, your knowledge of the process going forward and what we need to, and as you can see, we are drinking from the fire hose of issues, right? It's all coming at us. So uh, please stay in contact with us. And thank you, Senator, your staff has been uh, amazing. And uh, Alex Flood in our office uh, couldn't, had, couldn't have done this without all those great uh, Zoom technicians and uh, pedagogy leaders there. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. Uh, so I think, yeah. Oh, okay, Thank so you. Think, With that, we are going to end um, the forum. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we hope to keep in touch with you all soon. Thank you all.